this topic is going to came out some work that I've done on approximate quantum error correction um, that is going to lead to a sort of discovering good approximate quantum error correcting codes in ground states of gapless 1D systems. Um, there will be some, some new results about approximate quantum error correction itself. Uh, this topic is also connected to quantum gravity. Um, it's specifically like the holographic correspondence that's part of the motivation for finding error correcting codes in these kinds of systems. Um, and uh, also I'll kind of include some general background around quantum error correction, how I understand it, uh, so that we're all on the same page for that. Um, so quantum error correcting codes uh, encode quantum information into a larger Hilbert space in order to protect that information from errors. And the word approximate here means that your information is protected and errors can act on it and then you can approximately recover the uh, information that was originally there and we'll make that precise. Um, so most research into quantum error correcting codes um, has focused on stabilizer quantum error correction. Um, so this is kind of an algebraic uh, definition where you have a, a stabilizer group and it's generated by certain generators. And if you associate these generators, which are like the local constraints defining your code space with a Hamiltonian, then you always get a commuting Hamiltonian uh, that exemplifies like gapped topological order. So this is why I'm putting in the word gapless, which refers to the spectral gap, right? The, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian uh, is kind of closing into zero, and that's already unusual. We have some existing examples of this in the literature, but to find codes outside of this uh, general stabilizer framework is pretty much a, a frontier in quantum error correction. Um, so that's why there's an emphasis on gap, gaplessness uh, in, in the title of my talk. Um, so also, I'll explain this, the holographic correspondence um, predicts that certain gapless spin systems, i.e. those which have semi-classical gravitational duals, will have uh, good approximate quantum error correcting codes in their ground space. Um, and uh, so, so the, the codes, the example of a code that I'll describe today is does not necessarily have a holographic dual, although we're still kind of exploring that. It's, it's not a discretized conformal field theory, but it has certain similarities. And one of those similarities is that if you have a quantum lattice system with a conformal scaling limit, uh, then it's going to be gapless as a finite size system as well. And also, just, just to be clear, when I'm talking about a finite dimensional Hilbert space, gapless just means that the gap is going to zero, not that it is actually zero, right? So it might be like you have a spectral gap that's one over polynomial in the number of qubit sites. Um, and in fact, that you have some, some macroscopic number of um, states which are very close in energy to the ground state. So that's the sense of gaplessness that I mean today. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, OK, right. In this talk, I'll kind of take qu approximate quantum error correction, which is kind of a specialty topic even within quantum information. Like I said, it's kind of a frontier. And I'll translate it into what I think are some more accessible conditions um, than existed before our work and uh, will be suited to the language of, of spin systems. Okay. Um, so kind of the outline, uh, so first I'll describe quantum error correction just in general. Um, so some of you may know the canela flamme conditions um, for uh, specifying whether a subspace is a quantum error correcting code. Then I'll describe, uh, I guess the laser pointer doesn't work, but that's okay. Um, the, is it visible? The, the, okay. Oh, um, so approximate quantum error correction in general. Then I'll describe the approximate canela flamme conditions, which are our conditions that we derived in the paper um, in order to, to, to give you something you could really work with. And uh, then at the end of this sort of section, I'll talk about error correction and holography. What's the connection there? I'll just kind of sketch it. I'm not really a quantum gravity person myself. Um, so, and then the next big chunk of the talk, I'll talk about examples of 1D gapless systems that embody these approximate quantum error correcting codes. So in this, in this section, I'm gonna focus on one particular example uh, which are these Motskin spin chains, but I'm going to really try to emphasize the general principles that you could use to discover approximate quantum error correcting codes in more general systems. And this will kind of include both the topic of local symmetries and parent Hamiltonians. Um, so given a subspace that you think would be a good quantum code, how do you construct a Hamiltonian which has this subspace as its ground space? 
Um, and then also the analysis we used, I think, is ripe for generalization. It's, it's, like a, it's a very uh, concrete combinatorial analysis of the reduced density matrices of the uh, states in this, in this candidate code space. So basically, we go from an understanding of the Schmidt decomposition, which kind of reveals the entanglement in the state, to computing the reduced density matrices and just verifying mathematically through combinatorial formulas uh, the, that uh, they form, that they satisfy our approximate canilla flamme conditions. Um, and then I'll summarize and conclude. And I'm not sure we'll get to this. It depends on whether the audience is interested. But I also had a recent paper on a completely different topic, which is quantum information in quantum cognition. Um, and I have some slides prepared on that at the end uh, that we can get to. You know, maybe we should view it as, as kind of two talks stick to get, stitched together. So feel free to ask questions during the talk and I'll pause on the summary slide to, to you know, discuss everything we want to discuss. And then I'll, I'll, I'll go into this quantum information in quantum cognition. Um, so, okay, so I'll start with a definition of what is a quantum error correcting code. So, um, so it's basically a subspace of a larger Hilbert space, and uh, it'll be useful to kind of have these parameters in mind. So n, k, d, uh, so just to give them the terminology, n is going to be our uh, physical qubits, k is going to be our logical qubits, the encoded information that's encoded into these n qubits, and then d is a quantity, a code theoretic quantity called the distance. Um, so, okay, so let's take a look at this definition. Um, so we have a, if we're going to encode k logical qubits, then the Hilbert space of those two qubits is 2 to the k dimensional. So we're looking for a 2 to the k dimensional subspace of a 2 to the n dimensional uh, overall Hilbert space. So you've got your original n qubits, they have a 2 to the n dimensional Hilbert space, and we're looking for a 2 to the k dimensional subspace. And that means that that subspace can be spanned by, say, some orthonormal basis. And now, now the non-trivial part is this condition for the code to have some distance. So the code having a distance, you could think of this as the uh, logical operators, or sorry, the uh, local operators that are protected um, by your code. So here, um, and, and I'm just assuming the standard quantum formalism throughout this talk, uh, ask me if there are any questions, but O here is just an observable. And uh, so psi i and psi j are elements of our orthonormal basis here. And so what this equation says is, first of all, if so, so actually, first of all, the off-diagonal case, if i is not equal to j, then this resembles the condition for classical error correction, right? Your, your code word, uh, your code state j, uh, if the operator o acts on it, you have no overlap at all with your other code state psi i. And you can't go from one valid code word to another if it's an error acting on the system. Um, so that, that's already something we have in classical error correction. But quantumly, we also have this uh, condition in the diagonal case. So when i equals j, uh, the two code words are the same, then this uh, co here is just a scalar that can, is allowed to depend on the operator o. But the key is that the uh, uh, co does not depend on i or j. So in other words, if i equals j, then O has to give the same expectation for every one of your code words, at least in this uh, case of ideal or exact quantum error correction. So this corresponds to the condition of local indistinguishability. And it's a uniquely quantum thing. And it really gets to the idea of quantum mechanics that if you have uh, some quantum information in a system and you measure it, well, then you disturb it or you destroy it. And so really what it's saying is if you're protected against operators of, that act on up to D of your qubits, well, then you shouldn't be able to learn anything about the information inside the state by acting with these local operators um, of support at most D sites. Uh, so in fact, when we, when we get to showing examples of approximate quantum error correcting codes, this local indistinguishability is going to be the, the more non-trivial condition that one has to verify. And is the reason that you have a big departure when you go from classical error correcting codes to the quantum case. Um, so, okay, uh, first of all, how do we define quantum errors? Well, so uh, quantum errors can be represented in general. They're not always going to be unitary errors, but they're kind of a general quantum operation is a completely positive trace-preserving linear map. So you can think of uh, the EI here as just linear operators. 
so we start from a state row um, and uh, you know we, we act with a quantum channel. This is kind of the standard form of a quantum channel. This is the trace preserving condition here. And um, we could think of these E sub i as error operators. They might uh, you know, go in and flip one of the qubits in a particular basis, or they might do something more complicated like um, erase that qubit, for example. So you could go from a pure state to a mixed state. This is a completely general formalism for representing errors on a quantum state. And so now if you have some subset of errors and you have a, you know, uh, code with n physical qubits, k logical qubits, and distance d, well, then you get this condition that looks a lot like our definition of distance, and in fact, it's closely related. So, so uh, this condition you know, was found in the 1990s and is just a way to verify that your set of states form a, a quantum code of a certain distance. And so if you go back to the definition of distance, um, then you, know, you could just call this e, k, e, l, uh, just a single operator o, and so in fact, regardless of what your errors are, if you satisfy the condition to have distance d, um, then you should be able to achieve perfect recovery of the encoded information if you have fewer than, you know, if you have fewer than d minus one over two uh, errors occurring on the state. But sometimes if you have a specialized error channel, then you might be able to correct more, um, but no more than say d minus one errors in general. Um, and uh, so the distance then is related to how many errors we can detect and how many errors we can correct. Um, so, okay, uh, right, so now let's talk about approximate quantum error correcting codes. So I said in the beginning that we're going to have an error channel uh, E acting on our code space and it's epsilon recoverable if there exists some recovery channel that after applying, you know, after applying the error map E to the state and then composing it with the recovery channel, we're back again close to the original state. So this is kind of a non-constructive definition because it just says there exists some recovery channel R. And in fact, this is, this is a major open area in the topic of approximate quantum error correction, uh, which is can you design efficient maps to recover if you know you have an approximate quantum error correcting code that might that's to some extent on a case-by-case -case basis. There's a, there's a general form you can write down for these recovery maps, um, but from a quantum computing perspective, you really have to evaluate whether that's a map you can efficiently implement, say by doing local measurements and classical post-processing on your state. Um, okay, so now we're gonna have kind of four parameters in our definition of a code. We're gonna add in this epsilon parameter. Um, so NKD epsilon approximate quantum error correcting code is going to be like before a to the K dimensional subspace of our N physical qubits. But now every error channel acting on fewer than D qubits then should be epsilon recoverable. And um, so again, why, why are we interested in this? Well, uh, oftentimes in coding theory you can describe uh, you can find strict relationships between n, k, and d, maybe for a particular spatial geometry, but then you might find that as soon as you allow just a tiny epsilon, you can get away from these restrictions and have codes that appear to be more powerful. That is, they could have a better rate of the code, uh, encoding more uh, logical qubits into a given number of physical qubits, and uh, you could also find that you have a better scaling of the distance. And Maybe uh, the picture that's starting to emerge, including from our work, is that these approximate quantum error correcting codes are going to be found much more often in nature. They can kind of occur somewhat naturally um, and don't have to be as contrived and restricted as, for example, these uh, stabilizer codes and, and topological gap systems that have been the most well studied. Um, Okay, so how can we, you know, so how do we verify that something is an approximate quantum error correcting code? Well, um, the idea has been around for decades, uh, and um, if you if you look at some of the old papers, they have a description in terms of the uh, in terms of the noise channel, the error channel, and the recovery map. Um, but it wasn't very concrete from the point of view of uh, many body physics. So that's why we um, we. Uh, proved a theorem in our paper about um, the approximate canilla flamme conditions, and there, there's some interesting, uh, interesting takeaway from the details of this. 
Okay, so, so it looks a lot like our um, original definition, or it looks a lot like the, the canilla flam conditions for perfect error correction, but now we're including that you have some epsilon term that is allowed to depend on, say, the operator O, but also I and J. So even in the I equals J case, you might have states that, you know, the error acts on them and they're not perfectly orthogonal anymore, or the error acts on them and it gives you some information about the state. You're no longer perfectly locally indistinguishable, um, but we still want this epsilon to be small, going to zero, say, with the system size. And so what we proved is that sort of the epsilon that appears in the standard definition of a, an approximate quantum error correcting code is related to these approximate canilla flam epsilons, but the relationship is exponentially bad in the distance and in the number of code words, which is not necessarily, well, okay, but especially with the distance. So what this means is, okay, it kind of quantifies the trade-off between how close you are to being indistinguishable versus how, uh, how you know, much recovery can you get uh, out of your state. And so in particular, if you want to have a power law distance, right, then you're going to have an exponential prefactor here. And so your local indistinguishability has to be exponentially, uh, they have to be exponentially close to each other, which is a pretty strong condition. It's a condition that is satisfied, you know, by a lot of these, these standard Tori code type of models. Um, but uh, for example, if you have, you know, if you have relatively large spacings in energy and you're taking energy eigenstates, well, then the fact that they have different energies already tells you that they're somewhat locally distinguishable. And um, so, so uh, this is, and then meanwhile, if you have a logarithmic code distance, then you can get away with sort of this inverse polynomial uh, level of indistinguishability. Um, so, so this I think is kind of an important general takeaway from this result. I should say it's not completely tight, so it doesn't give a necessary condition, but remember this, Epsilon recovery has to work for all possible error channels, and that kind of gives a, if you really want to guarantee it works for all possible error, error channels, then I conjecture it's pretty tight in general. So we should have this relationship in mind, which is that if our uh, basis code words, they're called, of the uh, error correcting code, if they're, if they're approximately um, distinguishable up to, say, you know, inverse polynomial error, then at most you're going to get a logarithmic scaling of the code distance and a logarithmic scaling of the number of code words, or sorry, the number of logical qubits. Um, so, so really you would like them to be exponentially close, um, and, and, and maybe that'll be appear more actionable when we get to the uh, example that I'll describe later. Um, Okay, so that kind of tells us about approximate quantum error correction and what are some efficient conditions we can try to verify for it. Um, so now let's talk about maybe some of the motivation. Um, so, right, kind of in, in the, you know, the standard quantum gravity theory uh, thinks a lot about this holographic duality um, that views quantum gravity as emerging um, in d plus one spatial dimensions from a d-dimensional, d-spatial dimensional, d -spatial -dimensional uh, quantum field theory without gravity. So maybe the, the well-known form of this ADS-CFT holographic correspondence, uh, semi-classical geometries in the bulk are associated with low energy states on this boundary conformal field theory. And if you, uh, and, and so moreover, you could think of performing uh, local, you, you could think of putting a local operator in the bulk and uh, this will also have some sort of uh, smeared out form along the boundary. Right, um, so, so this kind of led to the idea uh, a few years ago that, um, that you could understand this holographic correspondence as the encoding map of a quantum error correcting code. Or at least you could understand one corner of this holographic correspondence, which is the semi-classical uh, bulk geometry and low energy subspace of the CFT could be understood as, as the isomorphism between those is like an encoding decoding map of a quantum error correcting code. And um, so something that a lot of people are interested in these days is finding discrete realizations of this ADS-CFT correspondence. And so if you think about discretizing a conformal field theory, as I said in the beginning, you're gonna get, you're gonna get some lattice spin system, uh, maybe with local interactions, um, but it's also going to be a gapless uh, spin system. 
So, you know, and then, right, so, so this kind of motivates us to look for uh, quantum, approximate quantum error correcting codes in uh, the ground state of gapless uh, spin systems that have certain symmetries that, well, ideally you would like to find a, a discretized conformal field theory with these properties, but the model I'm going to talk about has a sort of translation invariance, a sort of scale invariance, but it sort of lacks the relativistic dispersion you would expect from a discrete CFT. Um, and then another thing just kind of that comes out of the holography is that one has to consider approximate quantum error correction because well, the, this stuff kind of only holds maybe to first order in uh, the quantum perturbations to your gravity theory. Um, so really these are fundamentally approximate quantum error correcting codes that we should be able to find um, in conformal field theories with, uh, with semi-classical gravitational duals and perhaps much more generally. Um, so, right, okay. Uh, Okay, kind of moving on to an example. So in general, a quantum error correcting code is a subspace. How do we associate it with a local Hamiltonian? Well, we can think of the local interactions as being constraints that determine whether a code is or is not in the code space. And the key is for the simple local rules to specify an intricate global entanglement pattern. And the reason that that's necessary is because of this condition of local indistinguishability. You're not going to get that without entanglement because if you think of, you know, something close to a product state, it just looks like a classical configuration. Well, then you can just measure it with a local operator and learn lots of information, say the all zeros bit string, right? You learn lots of information by measuring with a local operator. Um, so you really want but whereas if you have a highly entangled system, you know, or even just an EPR pair, and you look at one half of an EPR pair, then you're going to get a maximally mixed state. You don't gain any information. So entanglement is what gives you this local indistinguishability. And, but if you want this all to be the ground space of a local Hamiltonian, you want also that you have simple local constraints kind of fix an overall global constraint um, which is how one way of thinking of entanglement is that it's, it's some global constraint between quantum states. Um, so for a stabilizer code, what are the local constraints? Well, if you're kind of familiar with this, then you have these stabilizer generators, like the local terms of the torque code, and you just want to be in the plus one eigenstate of all the stabilizer generators. But these are, uh, the stabilizer group is going to be uh, an abelian subgroup of the Pauli group, so these terms commute with each other. And since they're commuting projectors, they individually have eigenvalues 0 or 1, and they, they're all simultaneously diagonalizable. This is why commuting projector implies that you have a gapped uh, system. Um, so another way of building a parent Hamiltonian, my favorite way, is inspired by classical random walks. So the Hamiltonian terms are going to enforce a set of local moves between classical configurations. And these local moves are intended to leave the, uh, to, to leave superpositions of these classical configurations invariant. Um, so these superpositions will be our code states. And um, just if you're familiar with classical random walks, you can think of a Markov chain having a stationary distribution. Well, you can also think of a quantum state that um, has that stationary distribution as, for example, a superposition, a, a, a coherent distribution over these classical configurations. And then so your, the local moves of your Markov chain can actually be translated directly into, um, into projector or other uh, Hamiltonian constraints that act on these configurations. And just as a Markov chain drives you to a particular stationary state, these Hamiltonians will fix as their ground state um, superpositions. Um, okay, so now, now I'm going to spend the next couple of slides on uh, a key example where we're going to demonstrate these kinds of, um, kinds of parent Hamiltonians and how one does the analysis to yield approximate quantum error correction. I think it's so ripe for generalization. You know, we just almost just rush this paper out with, this, with these examples in there. And there's, there's actually a lot of other material in this paper. Um, that, that I didn't necessarily plan to talk about to this audience. So let me, let me, let me pause and explain um, 
that uh, in case somebody wants to go and read my, uh, this paper with my colleagues at Caltech. Um, so we also have some results in there about codes at finite energy density, so constant energy density, so in the middle of a spectrum of a local Hamiltonian. And the purpose of discussing these codes is that they happen pretty generically. So in other words, if you have a translation invariant 1D system and you look in the middle of the spectrum and take translation invariant eigenstates, then these will with high probability form a good approximate quantum error correcting code. Um, but okay, so, so this has connections with scrambling and quantum chaos and the connection to quantum gravity, um, but it's kind of, so there, there are multiple results in this paper, but for this talk, I thought it would be best to focus on putting these codes into the ground state of um, such a Hamiltonian. Uh, yeah. When you get to the end, um, I was planning to ask, ask you to give an overview of quantum computing 101, because in this room, we have uh, really no one specializing in that. Everybody here is graduate or PhD level, but they're a mix, algebraists, astrophysicists, chemists. So we have a mix. So if you, the thing is, is if I would have told you to do that earlier, it would have been better, but I messed up. But why don't you, it, it can just be a few minutes, whatever you think, you could use the whiteboard, but maybe give our group uh, some of the conceptual tools of what quantum computing is and maybe the challenges and errors in general and then take and then take take over from this slide or wait and go through this but i know that everybody here has a different spectrum of understanding of the things you're saying from being almost lost to totally getting it <laughs> okay well thank you for for stopping me i'm just meeting most of you uh, for the first time today um, so let's see um, you know what kind of general background prepares for this setting um, uh, so, so, okay, so usually we describe quantum computers as uh, consisting of, you know, uh, qubits, which are two-level quantum systems acted on by discrete unitary gates. Uh, so this is the quantum circuit model where these uh, states of these qubits involve, evolve unitarily through time in an ideal quantum circuit. Um, and, uh, Basically, errors can be any, anything, any quantum operation that occurs on your state that isn't one of the unitary gates that you intended to implement. So it could be as simple as you know, going in and flipping a qubit from one to zero. Um, even though it's inside of some superposition, you just apply a Pauli X operator. So you could just think of Pauli errors. Those are unitary. And then the other kind of errors that I like to think of are erasure errors. So you imagine that you have your n qubits and you evolve them along, but one of them is completely lost to you. Um, so then, you, then that's going to take you from a pure state to a mixed state. You lost some amount of information. Um, and uh, so the, the right, uh, this is another type of error. And so how would you perform correction well, in general, remember what I said in the beginning, which is that in quantum mechanics, if you want to go in and kind of um, gain information about a state, well, then you might destroy the information that's in there. So you basically want to perform measurements, and those measurements will give you information about your code, but they won't tell you about the encoded information. So you just want to learn that there were some errors and where they were in the system without learning what information was underneath those errors, right? Um, and so uh, these are kind of related to these local Hamiltonian constraints I'm talking about. These are the checks that check whether you're in the code space or not. And if they're violated, either completely violated, like you're in an excited eigenstate of one of the local terms, or maybe you're, maybe you're just slightly, uh, um, maybe the local terms don't commute with each other, so there's just a slight variation uh, violation represented by some non-zero energy, then you would still like to detect where those errors occurred and what they were, but without, you know, because quantum mechanics is linear, so we can, w regardless of what information was, was in the state to begin with, if we just know what the errors are that occurred, then we can try to proceed to undoing them. And that undoing them is probably going to happen through a series of measurements, um, and classical post-processing where you try to come up with your best guess 
you know, I perform these non-destructive measurements on my encoded quantum information, and here's my best guess at whether there were any errors, where they were, what type they were, and what I have to do to fix them, and then you'll have a few rounds of this process until you have satisfied your conditions um, for your state to be error-free. That was kind of a, a pretty general question, and it's a little hard to think on, on the spot, but maybe we can, I mean, it, are there specific questions, if it's a good point for that? You're working with the gapless. Working with? Gapless. This is going to be a gapless system. Yeah, that's right. Maybe point out the difference for the, the gap at topological quantum computing. Sure. So if you have um, kind of a torque code type of model, then because all the local constraints commute, this is actually a nice advantage because you, that means you can measure them all simultaneously. And if one of them is not satisfied, right? Um, so, so, right. So, if any of these constraints are not satisfied, then you want to flip it back to being satisfied. Uh, and you can, you know, you can do that basically by. Um, well, so you so you want to measure these four local operators that are in your Hamiltonian terms, um, and then apply a correction if necessary. So if you're in the if you're in the minus one eigenstate of one of these terms, you want to flip it back. Um, for gapless systems, it's perhaps more difficult to even diagnose what error syndromes um, you have on your states because your constraints don't all simultaneously commute with each other. So. One of the things that I'm trying to communicate in this talk is that the conditions for approximate quantum error correction don't in themselves give you directly an efficient procedure for performing these corrections. It's really, at this level, it's a global procedure. Um, and uh, so actually, even in my examples, even in the paper, we don't necessarily give a complete fault tolerance scheme for efficient computation in the ground states of these gapless models. It's, really just identifying code theoretic properties of these ground states. Um, and then, yeah, then people can go on to think about how to actually perform the corrections in these models. Um, so the, the approximate, I don't know, there's something about um, epsilon going to zero, some sort of limit. Sure. And um, so, yeah, in the space of codes, something like that, um, there'll be like an approximate one nearby. Um, yeah, uh, so, so, so it's not necessarily referring to a metric on the space of codes. Rather, the epsilon refers to how well you can recover your original state. Um, and so the recovery is, is no longer going to be perfect, like it can be kind of in the standard topological quantum error correction. Um, so, so some parts of your state may be lost forever, but if you can recover a state that's close in trace distance, then it'll match almost all of the observables of your original state, right? So in this kind of many-body physics context, talking about Hamiltonians on a line of qubits, then we have this parameter n that is the physical qubits, and it's natural to consider asymptotic scaling with n. So we would like, at the very least, this epsilon to go to zero with n, so that if you take a thermodynamic size system, then you know, you'll have very, very good approximate uh, recovery of your quantum information, at least possible in principle. Um, and, okay, just kind of saying some, some general things. Um, here, this local indistinguishability is probably one of the most important conditions that I wanted to convey. It's something that I understood much better from this project. And so, if you have some operator that distinguishes between two quantum states, um, say, you know, one, one psi i gets a plus one eigenstate and psi j gets a minus one eigenstate, then if you apply this operator to these states in superposition, you're going to put a phase on one of the states, um, but not the other. And this phase is going to look like a logical error in your computation. Right, because the kind of states we want to represent, right? So quantum mechanics, you can expand any general state um, in terms of some basis, and you can think of uh, the amplitudes as containing both magnitude and phase information. And so now this error that distinguishes between the two states, because it has to act on linear superpositions, can now create a phase error, and it's a logical error. Um, so, is there a 
this is a good whiteboard to use, maybe? Yeah, you can erase uh, any, everything on there. OK. Um, you know, so maybe, maybe the state I want to encode is just a simplest possible superposition of a single qubit. And I'll ignore the normalizations. And um, so now I might uh, assign you know, two states, psi i and psi j, but now just call them psi 0 and psi 1. So this is just a single qubit uh, up here, but these could be in some larger Hilbert space. Um, say, you know, uh, the Hilbert space of five qubits. And um, so, so now you could, right, so now these two states, you could define them to be you know, zero bar and uh, one bar, right? They're your logical states. And uh, so now you want to take whatever you had here and encode it in some superposition of, of these guys, which each of these are individually five qubit states. And now the argument I was just giving is that suppose we had some operator A um, such that, you know, some, some operator that this is, say, a plus one eigenstate, and this is a minus one eigenstate. Then if I act with that operator, right, it'll take me to the linear combination uh, with a minus. And this will be a logical error, because these two states you know, differ from each other. It's, I'm no longer uh, encoding the state that I wanted to encode once this, this error A acts. Um, so this is why local indistinguishability is so important to quantum codes in particular, is you're acting on linear combinations of states. And if your operators treat those states the same, then, then it's good because you can't create you know, a logical operation. Um, you can't create an operation at this level that says you're, you're in a different state than before. Uh, whereas if the, the operators do distinguish between your code words, you can apply these kinds of errors. Uh, so, so yeah, the simplest kinds of errors to think of then are like phase errors where you change the phase of one of the amplitudes or just bit flip errors. You know, you could have this state and flip zero and one, that would be a bit flip error. Um, Okay, uh, so, so right, so that kind of explains the, uh, the epsilon is that we're going to have these types of errors apply. Now, our states are approximately indistinguishable, but they can still be slightly distinguished by a local operator, which means that you could mess up some of the phases a little bit, but you're still going to be able to recover your encoded state uh, with good fidelity. Code distance and the entropy. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so, in a way, there will be a relationship because your entropy determines how large of a region you can take while still being locally indistinguishable in this way. Um, so, uh, right, because if you, in my example of an EPR pair, and you just measure one of the bits, and then you get you know, maximally mixed state with no information, the entanglement is really helping you achieve uh, local indistinguishability. Now, if you think of a spin chain, and it's highly entangled, and, and you look at a single qubit, you might, you might have all your local observables just be zero, maybe because you have uh, isotropic symmetry. Um, but as you take a larger and larger region, um, you're going to potentially see more features of the specific states you have. So one way of thinking of the entanglement entropy of a region of a large spin chain is it's, um, it's the uh, amount of information you need to correctly associate the interior of your region with the exterior of the region, right? You have to kind of patch them together, and this requires kind of communicating some information between the region R to the region outside of R. It'll, be, it'll become 
clear actually when I, when I do this example how entanglement works. Um, but, but in general, I would say, yeah, a larger amount of entanglement is going to be better for the code distance. Um, it's not exactly a theorem, but if you have like logarithmic, like area law with corrections entanglement. So, so if your entanglement of a region R goes like the boundary of the region, maybe multiplied by the log of the size of the region, then you're going to be limited to this um, uh, logarithmic distance and number of code words at the same time. Yeah. So then perhaps it's true that a search through the space of all topological phases of matter where you measure the entanglement entropy and find the highest entangled network of n atoms, perhaps when, if one could find that or, or prove or believe that that configuration is the most entangled, that may be an optimal uh, system for quantum, topological quantum computation. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would think that's, that's, um, that has a good basis for being correct. Um, of course, you can think of something like the, the Tor code or the surface code, where you have n sites, you know, arranged in a 2D lattice, and actually all you need is a line that wraps around the code, and this defines your distance. So it's like square root of the number of sites is the distance of the code. But also this only encodes maybe one or two logical qubits, depending on what kind of surface you, you put the code on. Um, and so if you want a lot of Q, if you want a high rate for your code and also a high distance, then you're, yeah, you're going to look for a large amount of entanglement. And another thing we know in condensed matter is that when you have gapped systems, this kind of limits your entanglement to be more of the area law type of form. Um, right, so, so yeah, if you, if you want high rate and high distance that is both scaling like a power of n, they have to be sublinear. You know, you're never going to encode n logical qubits into n physical qubits. Um, no cloning would prevent you from doing that. But uh, if you could get something that scaled, you know, almost linearly in the distance and the rate of the code. Um, so for, yeah. So the errors, like, do you, when you detect the errors, do you decide can you decide what type of error is coming, or you can't? You have to like try to correct it different ways. Um, so, so it turns out that we can. Um, it's kind of like these bit flip and phase errors sort of perform. Uh, they 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 give you a a basis almost for all types of errors that you could have. And so you really just have to correct for these two types of errors, at least in the model where your noise acts um, independently, which is the model that we almost always consider in quantum computing, is that we have independently and identically distributed noise on all of the qubits, as opposed to, say, coherent noise. And then, then yeah, everything is either going to be like an x-type error, you flip a bit with a poly-x operator, or a z-type error that you, you assign some phase. And so you could think of uh, quantum error correcting code as trying to correct for these two types of errors at the same time, whereas a classical error correcting code just has to correct against bit flip errors. Um, yeah, what about the, the, you said that you can lock, like lose a bit or something? Like yeah, erasure errors, yeah. Uh -huh. Right, you could have that as well. Um, but th that turns out to just take you to a, a mixed state. So if you think about the, the sort of quantum channel formalism, it takes a pure state to a mixed state. But a mixed state is just a probability distribution over pure states. And each of those pure states will itself be derived from the original state by one of these two types of errors. Yeah. OK, uh, so, so maybe it'll help to make things more concrete. So consider a spin chain. It's going to have n sites like we've been talking about. But each site is going to contain a spin one particle. So this can be called a, a q trit instead of a qubit. And on this, on the set of basis states for these q trits, um, I'm going to define a, a sequence of local moves. So you could think of 0, 1, and minus 1 as just the values of the SZ operator acting on each side of the q trip. And the moves we're going to have are 0, 0 goes to 1, minus 1, 0, 1 goes to 1, 0, 
and 0 minus 1 goes to minus 1, 0. And you can think of these as, um, as almost like measuring heights. Well, there's a lot of ways you could think of these simple rules, but I like to think of them as heights. So make 0 flat up 1 and down minus 1. Um, so these moves say things like you can take two flats and go to an up-down. Um, or you can take a flat and an up, and you can move the up to the other side, so you have an up and a flat. You could also think of these as almost like the simplest example of quasi-particles, right? This is like the vacuum, this is a particle, here's its antiparticle, here's a particle moving through the vacuum, and then the last rule a flat down goes to down flat is again like the antiparticle moving through the vacuum. Um, so, so there's various things we can immediately read from these rules, which is that the sort of total particle number, particles minus antiparticles, stays conserved. But of course, in the language of these qtrits, these are just spin variables, so these are magnetization. So the overall magnetization is the thing that's preserved by these rules. Um, and so moreover, I'm going to think of, so I'm going to think of um, uh, the qtrits as being on a ring so that I have perfect translation symmetry everywhere. Um, so you can just apply these rules to any neighboring sites. And we can already start to see the simplest hint of something I talked about earlier, which is you have simple local rules, but you do have an overall constraint that's enforced, which is keeping the magnetization constant. So what these rules are doing is generate, taking you from one classical configuration. A classical configuration is just a, a trit string, right, uh, n trits, and they take you to another classical configuration, they're simple rules, but they somehow enforce that you preserve the overall magnetization uh, throughout the process. Okay, and these local rules can actually be directly translated into, uh, into local projectors, which can then be taken as Hamiltonian terms. Um, so, so we'll go through that in a second, but um, if people are fairly familiar with classical random walks, we can think of, you know, what, what is the stationary distribution or distributions of this classical random walk. Um, so because these local moves preserve the magnetization, they also commute with the overall magnetization, right? So you should imagine that you're going to have degeneracies that are labeled by different different values of the total particle number, if you like. So let's think of, um, of what those would be. Well, if you have total particle number zero, you can generate all possible configurations this way. You can, you start, that is starting from, say, the all zero string, the vacuum, you know, you can, you can create all possible locations of these particles. And, you know, in this kind of language, right, there, you're going to have ups and it might go below the axis for a while. So you can just think of them almost like a Brownian motion path, right? That's, that's what they'll converge to in the limit. And so if we took this thing as a Markov chain, we would, uh, by just performing these rules always with equal probability, we would get the uniform distribution of all of these configurations as our stationary distribution. But, so a Markov chain, you think of it as a graph, your state space is a graph with vertices and edges. And what these rules tell us, because the rules define the edges, they tell us that this graph has several connected components that are, it's a disconnected graph, and it consists of several connected components, one component for each value of the magnetization, right? And for each value of the magnetization, you get the superposition of all configurations in that in that set. And so in fact, the reason we're going through this is because it's going to tell us exactly what the ground state of this quantum spin chain is going to be. It's directly related to the Markov chain. Um, so okay, uh, there's kind of a compact way of writing it here, but basically what the projectors, you know, 
the projectors do is they encode. So, so if you have a Markov chain, you can think of the adjacency matrix of its state space graph. And this is almost directly related to the Hamiltonian. It's just like you're, you're taking instead of the top eigenvector with eigenvalue one, you're flipping that around to be the ground state of some symmetric matrix, i.e. a Hamiltonian. These are, this is a somewhat standard technique, but it's not necessarily the most popular thing out there. And it's, it's one of my favorite things to explore. Uh, the, the models you can get in this way by starting with a Markov chain and mapping it to a Hamiltonian are models that don't have a sign problem. Uh, so, so this property is, um, discourages a lot of people because uh, it's like you're losing an important feature of quantum mechanics. Um, but on the other hand, what I like about these models is that we can use our classical knowledge to kind of understand their behavior, their ground states, and also prove things about their spectrum and so on. Um, so yeah, so our Hamiltonian will just be the sum over all of these two local constraints. So it's a two local Hamiltonian on a line of Q-trits. And the Hamiltonian assigns lower energy to quantum states, which are superpositions over many valid configurations that are themselves connected by local moves, right? So, um, so, okay, introduce some more notation. So again, these basis states, these are the classical configurations. So I'm calling them W and W1 through Wn then are just the trit values and the magnetization then is the sum over all of them. Um, the magnetization commutes with our Hamiltonian that we just defined because these local moves don't change it. And as we kind of just discussed, the ground state then is going to be uh, 2n plus 1 fold degenerate, and it's going to be spanned by degeneracies related to different values of the total magnetization, and it's going to be spanned by uniform superpositions of the basis states at a particular value of the uh, magnetization operator, right? So this is just some normalization constant out here. It's just some combinatorial thing. You can compute how many bit strings have a given magnetization, how many trit strings. And then what we have here is just a uniform superposition. And this is what I'm talking about, that it's a coherent version of the stationary distribution of the classical random walk that we had discussed on the previous slide. So these are the connected components of the graph. Now they transform into degenerate ground states of this quantum Hamiltonian. Um, so we'll, so yeah, what, how does this relate to the first part of the talk? Well, we want to show that the, these ground states, or at least a subset of these ground states, can be taken together to form a good approximate quantum error correcting code. And right, uh, there's kind of this general point here, um, which is that you know we'll, what we have is that our configurations are left kind of invariant by these local moves. These superpositions of configurations are left invariant. This is what we use to construct a Hamiltonian. So whenever you identify a good code space, you might try to come up with some sequence of local moves that connect the configurations of your code space. These will inspire you to have a parent Hamiltonian. Um, and then you'll have a model whose ground space contains that quantum error correcting code. Uh, so what is the code space? So first, it's not very hard to see that we can choose ground states of this Motskin model, it's called, because um, these are sometimes called Motskin walks. It's a combinatorial term that predates quantum mechanics. Um, uh, so we're going to choose ground states of this model fairly easy, easily to satisfy the off-diagonal quantum error correcting condition. So if you have two superpositions, remember, so we're interested in these states G, N, M, which are, you know, n superposition of all n strings with magnetization M. And so now you have two of these superpositions and you ask what kind of operator does it take for you to connect them together? Well, if you have magnetizations M and M prime and, and those numbers are a distance D apart from each other, then no D local operator that acts on D sites can turn, can take one of these states into one of the others, right? Because 
to take every state from to take every configuration in a GN M prime to a configuration in GN M, well, you have to change its magnetization by some value of at least D. Um, so the off-diagonal quantum error correction condition is not so hard to satisfy. Um, um, in, yeah. Instead of changing the magnetization, can you change the influence of its magnetization by rotating its dipole? Interesting. Um, so, so kind of like rotating it to a, a plus minus basis instead of a zero one basis. Right. That would take you to a superposition of different magnetizations. Um, but if you, but, but because everything outside of your D local operator will be untouched, still in this new superposition you have, um, you'll still have the property that all the bit strings, all the trit strings, you know, have, have magnetization in some window. So in other words, um, maybe do a simple example. Or Elizabeth, let me, let yeah. me um, better quantify the, the, what, what's behind the question. So let's say you have a two-dimensional <clears throat> quasi-periodic array of atoms and um, you have this, this uh, dipole of some magnetic atom and it's pointing with its north along one of five possible directions. I see. And, it, and so therefore the, the, mag, the force, the EM forces significant, you know, obviously significantly change on each of those five orientations. So you're, you're changing the influence of the EM forces in some sense without changing the net magnetic force of the of the dipole you know of the magnet itself so in that case it would correspond to a more complicated local hamiltonian that describes these magnetic dipole dipole interactions and you can absolutely you know obviously that's going to be a valid type of interaction and so it can be represented in this language as a hamiltonian um, and uh, but in this case, so when we think of kind of quantum error correction, the Hamiltonian that defines the code space is kind of just fixed. And we can imagine it as essentially ideal because it is the, it is the thing that describes the interactions in your material, right? And the, the errors are kind of coming in from somewhere else. So, so it, sounds like, it sounds like you're taking a very uh, physical focused point of view, which is that you know, what is the source of these errors? They're actually being caused by a stray dipole and its orientation can affect what type of error you have. Um, I would say that's not fully accounted for in this formalism because we're really just trying to come up with general conditions to protect against arbitrary errors. Um, what would happen if you actually turned on a new interaction or brought in a new particle? Uh, if you could bound the influence, like how many qubits, of your code it touches, then it would be captured by this uh, formalism, right? If it touches fewer than d qubits, I mean, geez, even if you erase those d qubits. So if some error happens to your qubits, you can always throw them away. Worst case scenario, you throw them away. So er erasure errors are, are you know, uh, if you can deal with those, you can deal with anything in a sense, yeah. Um, did that? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay, great. Um, Okay, so, so, oh, right, so I was just going to show, I think it's still worth showing a short example. So you can imagine here's a trit string of zeros, and you can imagine that, um, say you go in and you zap this guy, and it becomes a superposition of one and minus one. So now you're at two trit strings, zero, one, zero, plus zero. Right, so it's going to take this guy to this superposition, but both of these are only differ by one value of the magnetization from your original one, right? So you're originally at some magnetization, and you act now with a with a d local error, and sure, you could be in some superposition of states on that region d, but they kind of can't take you in the space of magnetizations further away than the number of sites they act on. Um, so that's, that's why these uh, simple superpositions of configurations satisfy the off-diagonal quantum error correcting code condition. So now, how do we show approximate local indistinguishability, the hard part, the truly quantum part? 
Okay, um, right, so like I was saying, if you have a product state, then product states can be very easy to distinguish from each other. Product here, again, if it's, okay, basic terminology is, means just a tensor product of our original basis elements. And so, for example, if you look at the state with the minimum magnetization, uh, right, magnetization minus n on all of the sites, then um, this is just a product state because it's like saying everybody's individually minus one. You don't have any superposition. This corresponds to the local moves can't do anything, right? Our local moves leave this state invariant as it is. Similarly, with the state of maximum magnetization, these are easy to distinguish. So these two states make a great classical code. They can, right, because if you're just thinking of these as classical bits, then you would need a lot of errors to transform one code state into the other. But they're a terrible quantum code because, because you can very easily apply a, a phase error in the sense that these are distinguished from each other. Um, so, okay. Uh, the states that carry very little local information, which is going to help them be locally indistinguishable, are the superpositions with magnetization close to zero. Because, yeah, okay. Um, and so it turns out, and I'll explain this, but first I have to tell you what the code words are and the result, and then we'll just talk about how it's proven. It turns out that we want to choose appropriately spaced code words within this range of magnetizations that is centered around zero. And kind of, uh, you know, asymptotically, square root n is just very, very tiny, very close to zero in the vast regime of up to magnetization n and down to minus n. So we're really picking our code words to be centered around magnetization zero. And the code we get, the approximate quantum error correcting code, is going to have logarithmic uh, number of logical qubits, logarithmic distance, and some approximation error going down inverse polynomially in the number of spins. Okay, um, so to do this, then we have to argue for approximate indistinguishability. And we're going to do this by computing the reduced density matrices on regions of size less than d and showing that these reduced density matrices between the different code words are all close to each other in trace distance. So it's a very, it's the opposite of an abstract argument. It's a very direct calculational type of argument. That's the kind of thing that I like. Um, so, okay, uh, we'll partition our set of sites, one through n, into a region of size d and a region of size n minus d. And here, I'm just imagining, uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be a connected region of size d, but for simplicity, let's imagine that it is. And, okay, so we can spend some time looking at this Schmidt decomposition, and maybe I can say a little bit about what a Schmidt decomposition is. Um, uh, so, but basically it's expressing kind of the entanglement between the region of D sites and the region outside um, of those D sites. And it's kind of using a self-similarity property. Um, so, so I guess if we say just in general a bit about what a Schmidt decomposition is, You have some quantum state on subsystems A and B. Um, and so in general, so say this is a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space, um, but A is n over two, uh, A is n over two of these qubits. So you could think of them as qubits on a line. Here's A, here's B. And we're gonna think of kind of an imaginary cut between these two halves of the system. And what we want to talk about how entangled is A with B. And the way you do that is by expressing this as a sum of, um, so let's see. So uh, we want to sum over the size of the Hilbert space of the smaller of the two, but in this case, just two, two to the n over two. So we're going to go from i equals one to two to the n over two. And um, 
And you're always guaranteed to be able to put this in a form where you have some coefficients which are non-negative. Um, and you have, so what's special about this form is that we're not summing over the full Hilbert space, but rather just half of it. And we're saying kind of like, if you, if you know the state, the, these, these eyes are just schematic because these Hilbert spaces could be of two different sizes, right? You could imagine that B goes on and on. In fact, go ahead and do that. And now A is much smaller. So you could really think of these as, you know, phi I and psi i. They're both labeled by the same index i, but they are different states in different Hilbert spaces. But what it's saying is that for each state on A, it has a partner on B. And uh, that's what the Schmidt decomposition says, is it, it allows us to look at only region A and ask about how it constrains the state of the whole system outside of A. And this, this basis, these phi i and psi i, are not going to be like our bit strings anymore, right? Because our bit strings, we have to sum over this exponentially large number of them to form our whole state. Um, but now these could be quite complicated states in themselves. The main thing is that they correspond to one another um, in the Schmidt decomposition. And um, so, so actually, maybe it'll, it'll help if we turn to this example of a Schmidt decomposition for the system we've been discussing. So we're going to take, take the states that have magnetization little m. And you're going to think of the two regions a and b. If you know the magnetization in one of the regions is r, then the magnetization in the other region has to be m minus r. That's the sense in which our global constraint is expressing itself in the Schmidt decomposition. But now, the interesting thing is that we had a superposition of, like, the interesting thing is that this formula is correct. So we had a superposition of all possible basis states of a given magnetization. We can express that as a sum over a product of states. Ignore the coefficient for a moment. Just focus on what configurations are in this decomposition, right? So in our product of states, it's kind of like a self-similarity, right? You have all possible superpositions of a given magnetization. You can decompose that as having a certain magnetization A on A, the corresponding magnetization on B, and then you stitch them together to obtain the right overall uh, magnetization. And one of the reasons that we like Schmidt decompositions, well, you can immediately read off of them the entanglement of the reduced state on just region A. Um, so that's what I was going to do in the, in the next step. Um, OK, that's what we were saying. So in the next step, I was going to say, from this, we can talk about the trace distance between the reduced states in terms of these combinatorial factors. Um, I think, OK. Uh, can you say that the EI encoded information of the classical round the wall? The, the BI? Yeah, the EI, yeah, yeah. They, they, well, so, so in this example here, um, right, like, GDR is the set of all strings of magnetization R on the region of size D, right? So, so those, are, those are configurations uh, um, of the classical random walk on a region of size D, yes. Um, so, uh, OK. Um, One way to impose the classical configuration to get the unitary evolution. One way of encoding. So, in a way, there's no time evolution in what I've been discussing, although you could use this Hamiltonian to generate time evolution, and then it would be like a, a quantum random walk. Um, but actually, one thing that I've explained, I think, in, in, in these slides is that if we just take, if we take a classical random walk and it's dynamical, but we can also view it statically. 
right? We can view it as a graph with weighted edges and weighted vertices and a stationary distribution on the graph. And this can also be translated into a static property of a quantum system that is a, a Hamiltonian. It's, it's the matrix corresponding to that Hamiltonian and the stationary distribution then gets translated into the ground state. Um, so, so there's not necessarily any unitary evolution at this stage. This is a ground state of the Hamiltonian, so it would be invariant under the evolution. But yes, you could definitely consider taking superpositions of excited states, or you could, you could imagine starting from, say, the all zeros bit string and just turning on this Hamiltonian. What would it do? That's another interesting question. It's not directly related to what I'm saying, but because the Hamiltonian conserves magnetization, right, it's going to keep you within this magnetization zero sector. Um, but it's also going to be, if it's coherent unitary evolution, it's also going to come back to itself with some period. But um, in between, you're going to spend a lot of the time in a delocalized superposition, um, which, will be a, which will be a quantum version of the original classical random walk. Um, okay, but, but yeah, what I'm, what I'm trying to convey is that kind of the, this, this scheme for proving local indistinguishability. So you start with your state, you do your Schmidt decomposition, and from the Schmidt decomposition, you can actually obtain the reduced density matrix. So the reduced density matrix means that you traced out everything that happened outside. It's very similar to just erasing what happened outside. You're really, it's as if you're looking only with local operators on a certain given region and nothing outside that region matters. And uh, so to, right, so if you can quantify how close the reduced states are together, you can quantify how close uh, any, any observable acting on these states has to be close together as well. So that's, that's a very direct, straightforward, concrete way of proving local indistinguishability. It doesn't use any fancy higher level tricks. We just understand our states well enough to write down a Schmidt decomposition. The Schmidt decomposition gives us the local states and uh, from there we can verify that the local states of any two code words are close together. Um, so I think that is completely possible to generalize these steps as well as the construction of a parent Hamiltonian to the kind of systems that you are all considering, right? Um, that's, that's why I emphasize this. Um, so, um, okay, kind of to summarize this whole part of the talk, we have approximate quantum error correcting codes can be found by satisfying, by checking these approximate canilla flom conditions, which give an interesting trade-off between local indistinguishability and the recovery error of the code. Um, if you have a quantum error correcting code specified by local constraints, you can put it into the ground space of a Hamiltonian. Um, Schmidt decompositions are a powerful tool for not only quantifying entanglement, uh, but also analyzing the local reduced state on a region, which is what you need to check to prove approximate indistinguishability. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, so the Moskin spin chain, uh, you were saying that that was the beginning of uh, this uh, endeavor yeah. of uh, evaluating these, uh, well, Qtrit systems and uh, QECs. So I was working recently with a uh, hexagonal lattice model. So can this be generalized to say a hexagonal lattice model with spin, spin one sites? Completely yeah. generalized, nice. yeah. Um, so really what you want to think of is your, so, so one thing we often don't do in quantum mechanics is choose a particular basis, right? Like in high energy, everything is done in terms of operators and, you know, you rarely look at the actual wave function in a, in a complete tensor product basis like we do here. But in quantum computing, right, it derives kind of from classical computing where you always have bit strings. So it's kind of nice to come back to that picture. So the first thing you start doing is thinking, what is my set of classical configurations? And this should be a tensor product basis. So yours is spin one, you may as well use this, this same basis that we're using here. 
And now you're going to think of whatever Hamiltonian you have. Is it a, is it a local Hamiltonian, like it's got, got finite range, or is it infinite range in your case? Uh, or? I, I was thinking of both. Uh, there would be maybe a finite range at first. And uh, what, yeah. according to what Klee has in mind, yeah. there is a, there's a certain uh, finite range. Yeah. Be. So if you, right, right. Um, if you have a finite range, that's the easy case, because that corresponds to doing local moves on your state. And so, so what you want to do is interpret the off-diagonal elements of your Hamiltonian matrix as they're going to take one, like each off-diagonal element takes you from one basis state to another basis state. And ideally, you want to be able to think of these as local moves. Um, you can't always view it as a Markov chain, though. That's this thing about there being a sign problem. So if you have off-diagonal matrix elements with various signs or they're complex, then you can still kind of form some of this picture. You form a lot of this picture, but it's no longer just like a classical probabilistic process because you also have phase information as you, as you hop from one configuration to another. You're introducing non-trivial phases. Um, but uh, Yeah, there are uh, more general transformations than just unitary here. So it would be more special linear or akin to special linear, but I see, I they see. They could be, well in this case we can extend them to uh, these exceptional symmetries as well that behave like generalized uh, transformations. They're uh, affine transformations on the projective spaces for the, for the okay. sites. Yeah. Okay, and, and so yeah, what you want to do then is understand that if you have a certain classical configuration inside a region R, then this should probably correspond to a superposition of a large number of classical configurations outside of R, right? And the reason for that is, is otherwise you won't have entanglement. Because if your configuration inside of R uniquely determines something outside, then your, the global configuration would be like one of these product states, right? So, so you almost, you want there to be a constraint, but also a lot of freedom, right? And mm -hmm. uh, um, so, Right, so you think of how the classical configuration inside of R relates to a bunch of different configurations outside. And if you think about this, then hopefully you might be able to come up with a, a Schmidt decomposition like we had, and then you can understand directly the local properties of your state, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, do you guys still want to hear about quantum cognition? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. <laughs> This should, be, this should be lighter. Uh, don't need much of a condensed matter background for this, hopefully. Um, so quantum information and quantum cognition. Uh, Matthew Fisher, a condensed matter physicist at KITP. This is, this is really his idea. So I worked on it in, in collaboration with a grad student at Caltech. But we're really working on Fisher's ideas. We were trying to bring, bring a, a quantum information perspective to them. So his conjecture is that quantum effects in the human brain could be manifested in phosphorus nuclear spins. So, right, uh, these are these turn out to be spin one half nuclei, and these are going to represent our biological qubit. And the reason that he honed in on these particular well, first of all, you want an element that is found in abundance in uh, you know in the human body, but you also want an element whose nucleus is going to have long coherence times. Um, so these times have been estimated to be on the order of seconds. And furthermore, they can undergo coherent quantum processes. And in fact, you can have a certain molecule that contains, say, two phosphorus can decay in such a way that the spins of these phosphorus nuclei are entangled in an EPR pair. Um, and uh, so this starts to form the basis for entanglement if your nuclear spins have a long coherence time and they can form these singlets. And so in this pretty recent paper posted on the archive, um, together with my collaborator at Caltech, we investigate kind of the quantum information processing capabilities of Fisher's conjectured operations. He, he identified the fundamental degrees of freedom of interest here. We wanted to model those in the language of quantum computing and also to investigate what they might be capable of. And I should say this is very much like, so, so I think Fisher posted his first paper on this in 2015. So this is all pretty recent, recent ideas. And we, find, we feel much more like we've kicked off the beginning of a story rather than wrapping anything up. So there's a ton of open directions. Um, OK, so a very important structure are what are called Posner molecules. 
So what happens is these phosphorus atoms can become bound together with calcium and oxygen in a particular arrangement called the Posner molecule. And the reason these are interesting is because they have even longer coherence times. They extend the coherence time of the phosphorus nuclear spins um, to something on the order of maybe days, uh, could be even longer. And um, so these Posner molecules consist of six phosphorus nuclei um, in an arrangement that resembles the faces of a cube. And so an important feature of these molecules, as always in quantum chemistry, you want to study the symmetries of your molecule. Um, so around a given axis, you have a, a simple rotational symmetry. So if you imagine viewing a cube along its diagonal and you focus in on the faces of, uh, of this cube, um, then they should have a threefold rotational symmetry. And we're going to label the eigenvalues, well, their roots of unity, um, kind of parameterized by this, what, is, what Fisher calls a pseudospin tau that can be 0, 1, or 2. And the reason this pseudospin is interesting is because it seems to further encode the information and lead to even longer coherence times. So these coherence times allow for quantum effects to occur on the time scale of you know, human daily life and cognition. That, that's, that's probably the best argument at present for why these systems are interesting to look at is their long coherence time and ability to form entanglement. Um, but uh, so Fisher's conjecture goes another step, which is that, OK, um, one thing that chemists can observe are that Posner molecules will bind together into clusters. Um, the, and uh, so he has an idea that this binding corresponds to a projective measurement of the pseudospins. So you take two of these tau values, 0, 1, or 2, and you add them together, mod 2, of course, to get 0. And the reason he conjectures this is something I think is a pretty interesting idea for 21st century chemistry. So it goes way beyond quantum cognition. He calls it the principle of quantum dynamical selection. So the conjecture is that nuclear spins, which are traditionally disregarded in chemistry, can affect chemical reaction rates because nuclear spin wave functions are entangled with the rotational states of the molecules and certain compatibility conditions of these rotational states will determine whether or not the molecules bind to each other. So I don't think it's, so he has a paper that is um, focused on this quantum dynamical selection beyond just the Posner molecule case. I'm not sure exactly how general it is supposed to be, but it should apply to other types of molecules. And in theory, this is something that you could observe. So, so maybe quantum effects in the nuclear spins really can have more of an effect on chemistry um, than 20th century chemists might have thought. Um, so the pseudospin kind of reflects the spin state of the original phosphorus nuclei. And the entanglement between nuclear spins, remember they can form these EPR pairs and they have a long coherence time. So the phosphorus uh, in an EPR pair, they might drift off to different corners of the brain and get, uh, you know, they, th then they might form different Posner molecules. And it can now be the case that the pseudospin values tau, sort of these symmetry eigenstates of these Posner molecules that are far away from each other can now also be entangled. And these pseudospins also have long coherence times. And so if the dynamical con uh, selection conjecture is correct, then entanglement between these distant super, um, pseudospins can affect the reaction rates um, that occur for the binding of these Posner molecules. So, so all of this we essentially assumed. You know, I'm not a chemist. I don't know better. It all sounds plausible. But uh, what would be the quantum computing possibilities with uh, these kinds of systems? So, so that's what we set out to model. And you know, can we do powerful information processing? Um, so it actually, so the first thing we found is that chemists don't usually bother modeling nuclear spins quantum mechanically. The position of the nuclei and their spin these spin orbit couplings are very weak, and so it makes sense when they want to compute the electronic structure of molecules that they just treat these degrees of freedom as classical and fixed. So the first thing we needed to do is to 
model the information that was encoded in these spin states. Remember, these nuclei are fermions, and so their, their spin states have to be anti-symmetric um, combinations. And also, we have kind of the molecular symmetries also um, are another thing that kind of inform what states, what, what our spin wave functions look like. So once we kind of, so we thought maybe this would be stuff you could pull off the shelf, but uh, again, that's why I call it 21st century chemistry, is uh, it's kind of a new idea that, that quantum nuclear spins could matter. So, so what did we find after we created this model? Well, we found a quantum error correcting code for the symmetry pseudo spin. Uh, that's not, not, not such a big deal because you just have six qubits inside of a Posner molecule and you just want to ask what kind of, how can you encode one qtrit into six qubits in a way that respects, say, the Fermi statistics and the molecular symmetries. So that was kind of cool. We, we showed that entanglement can affect binding rates by plus or minus a few percent. So, uh, you know, um, this, is, this was kind of interesting because uh, uh, going into it, we had no idea um, whether it would be a substantial effect or not. And so Fisher himself didn't actually get to do these simulations because what we did is by having an information theoretic model of the phosphorus spins and then modeling this binding uh, operation as a projective measurement, just compute, you know, in Mathematica, it's like a, you know, you got two Posner molecules, that's 12 qubits, 4096 dimensional Hilbert space. And so you can just apply these projectors and compute what the binding rates are. And they go up by these really modest amounts that I find intriguing because it's like, okay, if you look at chemical experiments, they're often to a few percent accuracy, right? So it's really plausible that this is a, a general type of effect of entanglement that has gone unnoticed in chemistry. So we also showed that Posner binding can perform a quantum teleportation protocol. Um, so this tau A plus tau B equals zero can be viewed as a a uh, noisy bell measurement um, uh, on, on the pseudo spins that can project, uh, you know, so in quantum teleportation, you basically want to communicate a quantum state. Uh, you want to you wanna move a quantum state from one subsystem to another by communicating only a little bit of classical information. Um, we showed that, that that is at least plausible with the given operations. And maybe the biggest one, the one, so the first three are just kind of advertisements. If you want, check out the paper. The last one I'll say some more detail on, which is that Posner molecules can form larger entangled structures, which can be resource states for universal measurement-based quantum computation. Um, and uh, so, so to explain that, I'll say a little bit about measurement-based quantum computation in general. I think it's a, a model that received a lot of attention in the early days of quantum computing. Um, it's currently not any of the favored approaches in industry, but if you really like thinking about topological order and, and quantum computing and material science, then I think it's good to be very well versed in measurement-based quantum computing as a possibility. So the idea is that it'll simulate the circuit model using adaptive single qubit measurements on an entangled resource state. So imagine that you just have some fixed state that is so powerful that all you need to do is, is measure a qubit here. Okay, I got a, you know, I measured in the Z basis and I got a plus one or a minus one. Now this next time I'm gonna rotate my basis by 45 degrees. Okay, I got a one instead of a minus one. So you're just doing binary measurements and the out and adaptive here means that the outcome of a previous measurement is telling you uh, what the new measurement should be, right? So, so this seems pretty powerful because um, you know you don't have to use complicated interactions that couple several qubits together. You just have some initial entanglement pattern, and it was also sometimes called one-way quantum computing because as you measure a state, you you you're kind of destroying it as you measure it, but you're consuming the entanglement and it's propagating your computation um, along the material. So what does it take to create one of these fabulously powerful universal resource states? Well, it turns out it can be done extremely simply. Um, the most well-studied example is called a cluster state, and you can associate a cluster state with any graph in the following way. You associate a, a plus state to every vertex of the graph, and then for every edge of the graph, 
you apply a controlled phase gate, which is just a diagonal unitary matrix, uh, one, 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 and then minus one. So uh, um, you just apply this controlled phase gate uh, to every edge, and you've now created one of these fabulous um, resource states that would allow you to do universal, universal computation with adaptive single qubit measurements. Um, so most kind of the, the, the standard example is, um, is to take a two-dimensional lattice, two-dimensional square lattice, and build one of these cluster states on that lattice. Every vertex starts in plus, you apply a C phase, and C phase is symmetric on the edge, so it doesn't matter which way, which one's the control and which one you apply the phase to. Um, and it's kind of like a one plus one dimensional picture. That is, you simulate a, a quantum circuit. So, um, Just to give an idea of measurement-based quantum computing, so you have some 2D square lattice, and maybe your qubits live on the vertices. And what you're going to do is you're going to make a measurement. You're going to make a bunch of measurements on the first slice, and it's going to propagate. These are going to be like the, the time one, time two of your circuit, and then here's your you know n qubits. Um, so that making the single qubit measurements kind of consumes your state in this direction. And the way it works is also really nice. It's kind of just based on, uh, it looks a lot like quantum teleportation, but now when you make a measurement to uh, teleport a state, you also have a gate that's applied. And if you're familiar with usual quantum teleportation, you actually often, well, in the standard scenario, you don't want a gate to be um, uh, applied, and so you undo it. But in the measurement-based quantum computing, you take advantage of that and say, OK, I'm going to keep the gate that was applied by me making this measurement and consuming these uh, qubits to propagate the state of the computation along. Um, so MBQC resource states are special. They're not just generic. You can't just turn any old. Uh, uh, condensed matter system into a resource state, but they also appear in many different models. And I think this is an underexplored topic as well, although there is, there's a community that steadily explores it. Um, so, and, and that community, for example, in the last five, five years or so, five or six years, has um, discovered that many valence bond states, including the spin three halves AKLT state on the 2D honeycomb lattice, can be measurement-based quantum computing resource states. So these are these are getting close to being realistic materials, uh, ground states of realistic local inter interacting spin models, and they can be resource states for MBQC. So uh, so what we showed is that states of entangled Posner molecules um, can actually generalize this spin three halves AKLT state and can be universal resources for MBQC. And so I said that a Posner molecule has six of these phosphorus nuclei, so that's six qubits. So in this diagram, what we're looking at is that sort of each of these, each of these ovals is a single Posner molecule, and you have these faces of the cube kind of split your uh, qubits into two groups of three, which have this shared rotational symmetry. Um, so that's what we're looking at here. And then sort of the lines between, so the red dots are the phosphorus fins, and the lines between them represent the singlets that, say, can be formed by the initial, um, by the initial chemical reaction. So given Fisher's conjectured operations, this kind of state could, in principle, form. Now, that's a very different, you know, what are the odds that some molecules freely floating in the human brain are going to form a 2D honeycomb lattice? Well, maybe, as I was explaining, planar entanglement structures simulate one plus one dimensional quantum circuits, but random graphs are actually better because they simulate quantum circuits with arbitrary connectivity. So kind of for proof purposes, proof of principle that you can do universal MBQC, it's nice to have this easy planar structure to work with, but in fact, this is the part of the project I was most excited about, which is that it really could be that these random graph resource states um, 
are, are, are useful. That it's, you don't, and, um, and actually it turns out there's some, some people wrote to us that, hey, maybe they actually do form hexagon, hexagonal lattices. Um, so there's, there's some, some angle for that as well. And another thing to mention is that these entanglement boosted binding rates can make the difference between being above or below a percolation threshold. So that's another interesting um, thing that comes out of looking at random graphs uh, and, and these kinds of generalized uh, valence bond states on random graphs is that uh, the, the percolation properties of the underlying lattice can be very sensitive to small changes of plus or minus a few percent in the, in the rates of sort of binding these molecules together. So, um, so okay, that's, that's what I have for quantum cognition. I realize it's kind of a, kind of a general overview, but um, it should be an accessible paper that explains even the basics of quantum computing is in an appendix somewhere because we knew it was for a wide audience. Um, so. In this project, did you have a chance to study um, any of the most recent papers by Roger Penrose and his co-authors? Uh, to understand their view of how hexagonal lattices, um, quantum gravity, and the more recent discovery, more in the last 10, 15 years, of long coherence times in the high temperature environment of the brain, which was a surprise when it happened, you know, when those discoveries occurred. Um, have you looked at that work or talked to Penn, you know, any of those guys? No, it sounds fascinating. I didn't realize they had a connection to hexagonal lattices. Right, um, so it's called the orchestrated object reduction model and it requires not only a hypothetical quantum, discretized quantum gravity theory, hmm. but, it, but it is inherently based on observational evidence of uh, hexagonal um, planes in the atomic arrangements around uh, microtubules. Um, so I can try to ask w one of the authors, who's Stuart Hameroff, who, who is a friend of our group, what, what he thinks might be the, the best up-to-date paper. But it's got a lot of, uh, of, re of citations. So it, what happened is it was a very controversial thing until they discovered evidence of long coherence times um, in the high, you know in the ninety eight you know Fahrenheit degree temperature of the human brain, wow. Then it became like credible, and then it became a worldwide community where they have conferences around this and a lot of academic support. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's a massive field, and I uh, I really got into it through this this here's an opportunity mm -hmm. to describe some quantum computing possibilities. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm still playing catch up when it comes to the biophysics and the the neurophysics um, that goes into these systems. And in fact, I've kind of left open here. Okay, universal measurement based quantum computing. How do we turn that into a realistic proposal for quantum cognition? Well, I'm not there yet, so apologies. I've so it's so really, yeah. obviously, it's kind of a deep question where one might say, now that we've demonstrated um, that Feynman's conjecture about quantum computing is now definitely true, is it possible nature somewhere through evol evolutionary self-organization has bumped into this process? Because if it's physically possible, right, then given enough time, it'll eventually happen. So did it happen? And is the best example in the human, you know, in consciousness, which is this hard problem of consciousness issue. Yeah, I agree. That would be amazing. Um, and another thing about these MBQC resource states is that you can consume them, but you can also add more on the fly. So even though these, these uh, Posner molecules maybe last for days, days at a time in terms of their coherence times, you can always be adding more to the network while you're consuming it. And as we were studying this resource state, there was even the idea of how long does it take to kind of build up these resource states, um, uh, you know, to be of a macroscopic size to do a non-trivial calculation. And I, it almost seems like that, that could correspond to the development, you know, of a child as they start to become yeah. more aware. Um, so, so if yeah. that were true, that nature somehow figured out this thing, which we now know is physically possible, uh, then one thing one can say about, the, about human um, biomolecules is uh, that they are highly organized but non-periodic. 
You get objects like DNA, which are quasi-periodic structures, and you have all these um, higher symmetries with these, all these five-fold rotational axes, right, all over microtubules, uh, DNA, and many, many of the other structures. So that's, to me, where the opportunity is in, for a company in quantum computing, which is when you look at what Microsoft and Google and China and Intel are doing, they're doing what they know best from their material science training, which is always in crystals. You start with a crystal, you impinge a magnetic force upon it along some direction, and then you notice that you get higher entanglement entropies, or in Google's approach, you know, they're focused on potentiating tunneling, but it's always with starting with a crystal and uh, trying to you know, distort it or distort it by doping, right? And um, instead, you know, you can take lessons from, from you know, uh, microbiologists studying, you know, very small nano, aperiodic, but highly ordered nanostructures, or maybe the quasi-crystallographer community, which I told you how small that world community is. Yeah. And, you know, and, and somehow synthesize their vast research in, into this uh, approach on, on, well, what is the optimal atomic motif for optimal quantum computing? Is it amorphous? Nobody would imagine that. Is it crystalline? That's what they're imagining, but it's always crystalline with some form of distortion, you know, in the approaches that, that we've seen. And if you look at neural networks in the topic of machine learning, right? I yeah. mean, they're very far from being crystalline, and in fact, they have spatially non-local interactions and yes. so on. And I think that'd be an interesting direction to yeah. take these ideas in, which yeah. is, you know, how could the brain possibly self-organize to be a useful quantum computer? Yeah. And, you know, we, we've seen uh, just classically neural networks organizing themselves uh, through reinforcement. Yeah, yeah so. Right. Cool. Yeah, great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you. Awesome stuff.